Save a beauty, boys. Save a beauty. And the Amiga clock is counting down to the start of race so five, four. Five. Right now we are crossing around it. the pin end, it is a leaky. Meanwhile, around race control with oh, the committee boat, it is Team New Zealand. Now, Peter, we see once again, as we've talked about so often, that the boat coming in from the pin has a little advantage because it's, it, it doesn't have the anchor line length that the committee boat has, but also it seems that the starboard end, the committee boat end of the line, is upwind a little more, as you can see very clearly here, that uh, Lingy is able to cross in front of Team New Zealand. Team New Zealand was slightly late on the entry, but more than that, that end of the line is upwind or favored. So we, we use this little tool to decide uh, that one end is better. We're just in front of know that one end is better. I expect these guys to be fighting for that end. So no dial up as the lead is able to cross. I oh, didn't have to go that. Team New Zealand to the left, on, Alingi to the right. Come on, mate. <laughs> well, the challenge now for the teams is to go figure to out not lead, only lead. not only which side of the line they're on. Yep, which is the committee boat is going to be the favorite end. Just listening on board, but it's still going to be a nice rain coming down from the left. Is that going to be a factor on the first beat or not? Is that going to be a factor on the first Yeah, but that's, yeah, it's going to be gone by the time we get there. Hey, that's good. So there's a couple of hundred meters now into the start box. The black clouds in the background. Over the head of Russell Coots. Yeah. That's coming. That's right on Terry, Terry Martangi on the end of front of the peninsula. And that is definitely coming towards the race course. And he just lied what it was in restart because all they've done is enter and keep going. Malingi now getting down near the, the large uh, 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 super yacht that uh, their owner. So you can hear the screams from the people on board in Baba. It's Barber over oh, by Anisto Federelli. Yeah, it's well. out to the left, the Lingy to the right. Team New Zealand now to the left. And the Lingy showing us that they want to go to the left. They're going deep after they've dived. He's going to head up now and aim for the start line. Team New Zealand may just go around Barber and come from a higher position, pushing down from the right point. Right No real contact, no interaction between the boats so far as we're coming up to two minutes now on the Amiga clock, getting very close. These eight boats now are making their approach and very much a time on distance. Two minutes. So Team New Zealand in the windward position coming around the manor of the farm of the super yacht. Meanwhile, it is a link down to Lua. So this is very much a time on distance. We saw a lot of this away. in Fremantle and a heavier way to bring. It's nothing like the 25 okay. knots they had there. It's only 14 no, knots. This is, uh, 25 to go. Peter, I put that down more to the fact that Lingy was thinking about up the course. They were trying to make some choices up the course, and they just gave them time to think by doing one long trip down and one long back. Rather than getting into some circling and maybe miss something that's happening. Because we do see, especially with this little bit of rain, there's some changes coming up the race course. And both crews are talking about that at 1 minute 10 to the start. How far the line? Both boats might be horsing here. Yeah. Looks no like to about 25 to the seconds to kill still to get to the start here. They don't want to be too early, obviously. Team New Zealand in a strong position to be able to push down when they want to. How far to the line? about time to kill for, say, about 20 seconds. Countdown on board, so to get the rhythm of how fast time goes, even though it's always the same, it doesn't feel the same in different conditions. We're maybe a touch slower than him here. It's the voice of Adam Beachel, this is Dean Barker. He won't get to you there. He won't, he won't get, get to you. To He's bowed down. He's bowed down. Adam Beachel reassuring Dean Barker. So there's Team New Zealand out to the right. They're both winding up now. This is a slingshot shot start. As the is going out to the pinion. The start, race four of 
set up right now. Team New Zealand has plenty of room between them and Alinghi, and they can hang in there in that position if the boats are equal speed. So Alinghi has got the early lead, leading by nearly a boat length, down to Lewis McKean. And of course, that's a, that's a position yeah. that Alinghi will try and squeeze slowly to the right of the screen there to try get Team New Zealand attack the way. Maybe get that ship oh, that that sure hoping, or, or expecting, not sure. hoping for, I should say, just expecting because it's, uh, there is rain over to the left, but one of the guys on board, I, I just I didn't a little catch whose voice it was, but they said that it's rain's gonna be gone by the time we get there. Adam Beachel said that. That's kind of what we're seeing right now. A little softer in tan. It's the voice of Adam Beachel we're here. Now look at the, what they've done in the back of the boat on New Zealand to keep the water from coming in back there in the very uh, back edges of the cockpit. They've put a screen on there. It's a light, uh, it's like light plastic of some sort. Now, quick there. The, the 18, 19 meter yes. advantage Alinghi had, really a lot of that came down to the start because they were right off the bus. Just going forward a little bit, same height. Okay, Norman, Brad Butterworth saying they're going forward a little, a little bit, bit same we have. Well, and our information there shows us that it's exactly the same as it was off the line. Close the range slightly. We have. Uh, I would agree with that from looking behind the boats that the range has closed, which means the boats are slightly closer together. You know, sideways. saw the limit there, a little bit higher. It's nice at the moment. So Brad Butterworth saying you are not slower than him. In fact, you're a Still little bit higher. Still going nicely, a little higher than him. Brad Butterworth saying a little higher, which well, means for non-sailors, a Lingy's bow, according to Brad Butterworth, is pointing up higher to the mark than Team New Zealand. So Team New Zealand sailing a little Still lower. Still going good. You can see there the Lingi is paying yes, for it a little that, bit. Yes, so just the arrows there, uh, that a Lingi's bow was going down. Uh, up okay, man, wave the moment. Down. Steady, boy. Average pressure out of the tank. And Team New Zealand at the tank. So Team New Zealand at the side of the tank away. Early advantage to a Lingi. So much of that came back to the start. A Lingi out to the left. Team New Zealand on port, going out to the right. It's a little lift there. And Brad Butterworth reassuring Russell Cooch okay, he's getting a lift. Any hit, any hit if it goes under 40, we've got to get on the other tech. It's going up. Okay. Well, Peter, we have seen about a three degree left-hand shift start, but nothing yeah, substantial. Yeah, I know, it's coming down quickly. So they're talking about the squall coming. Brad Butterworth coming down quickly. There's a real yep. black squall. We can't see it. Go here. Turi Turi Martangi now. Here comes the Lingi coming back. It's a lift here. They're getting a lift. That's their problem. They're getting lifted. Jumping around a lot. Brad saying yep. it's jumping Heavy around here. a lot. Let's go. So here goes the Lingi Tacky. Now Lingi Tack across, and they go up to Port Team New Zealand. They're holding on a port here. It's taking them out to Rakino Island. Now, Peter, we go back to that start. One of the reasons okay. that New Zealand had to tack away was because they were sailing into lighter air after they started. They started to get reduced wind speed, which means reduced horsepower, which means you've got to put your bow down and keep going. And that always advantages the, the boat that's on the leeward side. Additionally, because of the size of the waves they were sailing into, that left hand boat was looking better. And here we see they're just exactly the same distance uh, apart as they were off the starting line. That 18 yeah. to 20 meters that uh, Alinghi is ahead. The difference is that Team New Zealand's going to need uh, to gain a little bit to be able to tack and actually get to Alinghi with that sort of range. So Alinghi will have not had to tack. Yeah. Yeah. The little one they have is the starboard hand. Right hand for us. When they come back, Team New Zealand will be on starboard. 
but they need to be advanced at least half a boat length more than they are. Yeah, pressure one. To nail that home. Now, we have had a left-hand shift since uh, both boats have tacked. We're now sailing at 37, 38 degrees of uh, wind direction on than the him. compass. And uh, when they started, nice they were at 44. We a bit more breeze than him, I think. Yep, I would agree with that as well. Yeah. On a Lingy, they've got a little more pressure on the water. Just a little puff around them. Hit it. So that's the track they've you taken the since they started. There. The yellow trail of Team New Zealand in the middle there, forced to tack away to clear their air. And now as they Quite head up the speed, it looks like a Lingy on the left hand side nice of the blue there. trail is sailing a bit higher and we can just see that they're sailing a bit I closer to the mark than Team New Zealand. Now that is converting into an advantage. It's now out to one and a half boat lengths to a linky. Touch now when Team New Zealand here. tacks, that'll cost them another length. And when they do come back, unless there is a wind shift, a linky will be able to cross that head. So looking at on that margin, bow. just opening up a click further, we've seen that, that squall on the left-hand side of the course that's almost behind us as we're looking at this shot is favouring a linky there in the oh, foreground. Dear, just a couple of degrees. Brad Butterworth, comfortable with what they see at the moment, as they ought to be early advantage to a linky. And it all comes back to the start, I think, Peter Lester, doesn't it? As uh, Peter Montgomery and Ed Baird said, Russell Coots got it spot on. Coots pushed the start. He was within a metre of the starting line. Hey, the, the starting gun went. He's in New Zealand. Oh, he's squared at 45. Three quarters right. of a boat leap behind. Nice little shot of pressure here to build with. To get right the left hand side, get the first left hand windshield. Like a good tack. To extend out. So a little Holding the advantage through setting themselves up with a lovely start. And we're coming back that now. Way oh, this cross. Team New Zealand coming back on the starboard tack. But virtual spectator there showing a separation of 43 metres. A lady clear ahead, approaching up, awesome, coming up to the first cross. Yeah, oh, bad play there. We see the uh, skirts ready for trim on them that are uh, there to try and prevent uh, the onrush of water, which we saw damage Team New Zealand on race one. I think it's close here, Bertrand, hold that. First cross coming up. He's doing a bit of work, but this is it, the first cross, a linky, only marginally crossing. Team New Zealand going into a bit of a high boat. Also the double mast up here. Tony Ray telling Bertrand Passe it's a marginal cross. Let's just wait for what happens here. Yeah. 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 Start by Coots, Butterworth. Their time on distance leading into the start. Just started to fade. Certainly has been a feature and, and an absolute strong point. Pull a bit more in, everyone. Get it? Nice. Oh, yeah. Nice here. Yeah. Just started to hit us as we've got to. That's good. Well, what that's, that's telling nice. me. More pressure coming down. And Linky wants that's to good. protect the left. They could have crossed that had they chosen to. But what are the times now, Nisto? Elected to tack on the bow of Team New Zealand, force them right again. There's Brad, Ernesto uh, Federelli, the navigator, for the time to the mark. It's 10 this way, for the other. So 10 minutes on starboard and tank they have to sail. Four minutes on board. So here we see Team New Zealand again, tanking on to starboard. Trying to keep it close. This next cross will be a moment in the race. Trimming on Sally here. Hold that for a sec. A little more to come. Trim the main side on. Here in five. Adam Bischel calling the wind pressure, helping the trim as an helmsman. Plenty of communication going on for the position. And hold that. Decent sort of sea state on the course. We can see the boats and the bows of the boat just lurching into the waves. What are the times now, Nesto? Ben Butterworth asking for the ley line times. So that's the advantage at the moment, 40 metres. But here. the key thing here is the breeze has actually shifted around to the right. 
There it is there. The beginning of the race, the breeze was coming more from this direction here. We're now getting it from around there. Now that should be an advantage to Team New Zealand by virtue of them being on the right hand side. No less than just hearing of North Star now, the breeze at 041 degrees. So that's just the slightest little bit of right hand shift. But Alinky still hanging in there, but the thing here is what we could see is that when Alinky tacks, it will cost them a link. I no longer believe that Alinky can tack and cross Team New Zealand. Wind shifts coming into play again. Alinghi favouring the left. Just like in the early stages of this first leg. Team New Zealand being forced to the right. They're now getting just a slight Long shift edge. there, which is enabling them stay to ahead close of the gap. We see the boom, which uh, created problems. Can't stay ahead here. of those ones. Well, it was that style of boom. I actually think this boom's probably the, the one that they took off, maybe off into our 81. But it's certainly the same style. Now, another feature of the race will be, with the, the, the wind today is very moist, and the wind probably has got quite a lot of uh, horsepower with it. Out of the east, it's got a lot of moisture in the wind, so that means the power of the wind is, is quite strong. 16 knots of wind speed out on the course at the moment, so Team New Zealand in the windward position, Alinghi in the leeward position. I'm going to touch it, this one. And another what are the thing times to notice start? on Team New Zealand, they're using a different mainsail today. The roach profile of the mainsail, that's the head of the mainsail, you can see it's not as severe in terms of its profile. A lingi using that very square top sail. So Team New Zealand have gone to a slightly more conservative mainsail roach profile, more similar to what we saw by leaves. many of the boats in the Louis Vuitton Cup. We can see there, I'm, I'm talking about the head of the sail and the differences in the, the very much from the, the top of the mast out to the first batter. Yeah. Now, Linky down to Lewis, both yachts on starboard tack heading up towards the top down. mark. As we come across and look at Team New Zealand now, laying the advantage line on. Still 40 metres. Now remember though that Alinghi, when they tack, so when they turn through the wind and do this, is going to cost them one boat length. And I don't think that Alinghi will be able to cross the head of Team New Zealand this next time. So this has been, I would argue, a slight gain to Team New Zealand. Really, the trick here is going to be as they are now getting into the second half of this race is can Team New Zealand protect that starboard tank advantage, protect the Linky from coming back when they want to. And there's the East Coast base in the background. Brad Butterworth paying very close attention to the relative Still performance gaining, yeah. of the boats. And he thinks it's a Linky that's gaining. Yep, we're gaining. Last words there from Brad Butterworth. Yep, we're gaining. We hear Brad's voice dominating proceedings, yeah. but we do remind you there are six sailors with microphones yeah. on and they all get equal volume don't worry about that brad uses it very well and see how they go team new zealand against alinghi leg one of race four still just it this is just that what we tacked on to here for heading Going nicely, eh? A little bit of both. It is, it's down. Times now, Nesto. Yeah, I think so. We just pick it in, we get a little header, you get some good a good spot, let's go.
Come on. All right then, Dino. Hold that. And way. Seven minutes away from the first mark, and the Lingi endeavouring to cross and cross and just able to cross ahead of Team New Zealand. Crucial cross for Lingi. Now they have changed sides. They want the right hand side now as they approach the top third of the first one would be. Yeah, that's but correct. This, this one goes whole a little third on the other been side. set up by the start. That Alinghi managed to dominate. They were 18 metres off the line. They've capitalised on them to What's get it? a clear opening hit. And now top they can on. go to the right hand side Half of Team New Zealand. And remember the top mark is the starboard rounding. Oh. So the right hand boat has the rules advantage. As we'd expect, if Team if Alinghi get any start opportunity to nail there, right? home that initial advantage from starting. Butterworth and Coots do not miss that opportunity. A little header here. Well, Glenn, let's uh, have a look at heading. the comparisons Team New Zealand and Alinghi in the latter stages of this first leg. Let's go, eh? and There we see Team New Zealand still on starboard. Alinghi on port tack out on the right-hand side. The advantage down to 30 metres. But Alinghi will yeah, have that starboard tack advantage when no, they good. come back in. But one thing that's been very graphically yeah, demonstrated here it's is if we look at the relative performance of these two yachts upwind, looking at the blue trail of Alinghi, they are constantly sailing closer to mark number one than Team New Zealand. If we look at it there, just look at the way the blue trail is pointing closer to mark number one than the yellow trail. Then again, through this stage of the race here, again, we saw a Alinghi here going there. Well, Team New Zealand was sailing more of an angle like okay, that. Ready, mate. Now, that seems up. to be a slightly different mode for Alinghi. They like to sail higher and slower. Team New Zealand a bit lower and faster. Folks, fairly even performance all in all. And here we see Team New Zealand back on port tack, coming back to engage again with Alinghi. Alinghi starb attack advantage. And it would look at this stage like two a link is still very much in control of this race as they approach one mark number two one. By the time we get to them. Well, the water deflectors haven't uh, been in use at all on Team New Zealand today. They needed them on day one. They're out there. Not much of a margin between the two, but certainly PJ and Ed and Lingi have the edge, and they got it from the start. Well, the Lingi were right. This Barry Mackay. Some on. hooking on here, right. Alinghi out to the right, Team New Zealand to the left, and uh, Alinghi were right on the button. In fact, there were a few people around uh, the start who thought Alinghi might have been over the line. They were that close. He's tacking. Tried a thousand times and they couldn't get more precision. Absolutely excellent start for Alinghi. So Alinghi tacked right in front of Team New Zealand and brought Team New Zealand out to the left. Look at the mainsail on a lingy. And then look at the mainsail when we get behind Team New Zealand. And you'll see a very different philosophy. And that may account for we go, runner. the point of the way the boats are sailing okay, into that's the it. wind there. Well, Peter, there, Team New Zealand has been having trouble this whole leg. Ever since the wind came up above about 16 knots, they've struggled to keep their main full. It's been going inside out and then refilling and then inside out again. And that means you're overpowered. That means you've got too deep or too uh, tightly trimmed uh, of, a, of a Genoa, and the balance between the sails isn't correctly working. Yeah, so you look at done? a Lingi, and their sails, both of them, are, are slightly eased compared to what Team New Zealand is carrying. And 
twisted a little bit more, meaning that the top of the sail is, is eased out slightly compared to the bottom. And they are just sailing along rock solid. Yeah. And what that does, well, when the main is full, it keeps your all your loads correct on your trim tab, on your, your rudder, so that the boat just gets locked into a nice uh, straight ahead position. But when the main goes inside out, the balance of the boat changes completely, and it wants to bear away. So that's what Team New Zealand's been having some trouble with, is just keeping the boat up on the wind, because their main keeps going inside out. Now, even so, the racing is off the hook. So we're getting down to a boat length. A linky with more of a twist. Their main. 18 knots. Boy, it's black coming down from Kawa Island. And the passage between Turi Turi Matangi that we can actually see again. And the numbers the actually long peninsula here. that we can also see for the first time in 10, 15 minutes. We can see there's a major squall coming that we expect will have a bag full of wind and also a bag full of air. So Team New Zealand is great. Now going through the tack, here they are on the ley line. Uh, so Team New Zealand on the port ley line. line. They're above the port ley line. So here comes Team New Zealand with yeah, the tack. Just building here. Interesting to see they're just taking yeah, a little slower when line. they go through these big seas. The sea is getting broken. Really, there's not a lot of fall. It's a broken seaway, not a nice even fall the seaway as we get to the top. Line. Well, Peter, Team New Zealand did a smart thing by going a little beyond ley line here, although they may not have been able to attack exactly when they wanted to, because occasionally these waves, you just have to wait for one or two to go by before you can turn the boat. And uh, believe me, I've, I've, uh, I've learned that lesson <laughs> as we broke our boat in half to an attack in Alaska. Unfortunately for Team New Zealand at the moment, the wind direction has shifted around to its max right-hand direction of the day, 49 degrees. So it's five degrees to the right of what they started in, and it's about uh, eight or 10 degrees to the right of what they spent most of the leg sailing in. That should advantage Alinghi. But because yeah, Team New Zealand went a little bit beyond lay line, yeah, he's about they should be over uh, having to tack twice with Alinghi tacks in front of them. So it's now out to 50 meters. We think we're very, we're we're very close to the lay line here. We're on the lay line. Brad Butterworth telling uh, we're on Russell it's on the lay line. We're on the lay line. They say they're on the ley line. They're going a little bit further. Stand Another boat here. Link. Two, here they go. They're going to Three, tack right in front of the two, one. So Here's a linky tacking. They will lose a few metres of this tack. The key issue is, can Team New Zealand hold their position? Okay, I'm forward, you well, they will, Peter, and that's why it was smart for them to go just two or three lengths beyond ley line from that distance. Because now they can hang in there and not lose too much. But their efficiency will be cut down a little bit, but they don't need to be as efficient since they're overlaid. You see the markers to the right. They'll just ease the sails a little bit and aim towards it. Losing here already. Jam that traveler. Okay, I'm going forward, guys. What's going to be fascinating here is the hoist. Who handles the hoist best? Big wave. Yeah. So that's Dean Phipps, Curtis Blewett, Francisco Rapetti on the bow of the key. He's the chase. So here comes the hoist from last man, Nick Heron. Let's go, Chico. New Zealand. America's Cup. Race 4, 2003. One. A linky round the mark. And Team New Zealand click off on the Amiga timing, just eight seconds a stir. So here comes the hoist, lovely hoist from a linky. Well, Peter, Team New Zealand okay, hold that, vinegar hold that. filled exactly at the right moment to help them serve on a big wave that they were just about on. And it seemed that they actually gained about a half a able to, to, to squeeze forward on a lingy as they rounded the mark. But as the graphics showed us, and as you talked about with the time, it was exactly two lengths there between the boats. And that's bow to bow, to bow. And so there's only a link in between the boats as they sail down this run. Clearly, Team New Zealand is in a position to be able to affect the wind of a lingy. And whether they can effectively block and get, get ahead of a lingy is going to be a real challenge. But they can make a lingy's life very hard down this run. The wind now at 21.3 knots. 
And we've had a shift to the left. It's over to 37. So that's the max of the left hand breeze. We do have a, a little bit of a rain this cell way, pushing in the other. behind us. It looks clear where the boats are, but in about five minutes, they'll be having some rain. And usually on the front edge of that rain, uh, there's a little bit of a wind shift. Right, 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 right. right now, we have 22 knots, maximum breeze of the race, out of uh, 39 degrees. Beautiful. Put a length and a half on them there. Just get waves. The margin just opening and closing by a good length each time one of these boats gets onto a surf on a wave. It's all about momentum and, and teamwork and, and, and timing between the helmsmen and the trimmers and the crashers on your to place chance. the bow of the boat on the steepest part of the way. And once the boat starts to accelerate, the trimmers will pull the sails on as the wind angle, the apparent wind angle moves forward. And if you can get the boat on a roll, it doesn't take much to just gain a, a full 25 metres or a boat length. The waves in this it's still lower, condition same are speed we are, lower same speed, just rolling down in front of them. To the relative performance on the downwind Good pressure leg, behind us. You've got to come around and right hand breeze. Still the, the helmsman to place the boat in the correct position. Both boats under spinnaker. Right now, it's quite right hand breeze. And out on the course, PJ, there's a bit of new breeze arriving. We can hear Brad, Brad Butterworth talking about it. Well, we'll be uh, see this... Um, those dark clouds coming from uh, the Kowau area through the Pocket really Road Pass. This is the most pressure you're going to see and right here. Brad, this is the most pressure uh, you're going to see right here. We've got 22 knots at the moment, coming from 39. So 22.2 Three now. minutes to the bottom mark, Jack. So three minutes to the bottom mark. Boy, the bow going under here. Wet work on the bow for Jeremy Loma, Matt Mitchell, and Nick Heron on the fourth deck for Team New Zealand. Indeed, they've got themselves positioned in the wake. You see it right in front of the bow right there, right in the wake of Alingi, which often is a good place to be, except when you're trying to sail real low, which is what they're trying to do now. They're both a little bit underlaid, trying to sail a little bit uh, deeper downwind or farther away from the wind than their optimum angles would be, and that makes it awfully hard to steer with the front of the boat underwater like that and the wave pushing your bow around. This is a tough spot for Team New Zealand. Look at this, look at the water. And here goes another surging forward right here. The speed's going up uh, a knot, knot and a half, maybe two knots from its normal downwind speed. No lifelines here, Ed, like you have on round the world, folks. Uh, you see those little railings that go around. The railings on the side there are only, uh, you know, 150 millimeters high. I mean, there's nothing there to hold on to. And it is windy. It's blowing 22 yes, solid right now. There's rain coming. They will sail this next weather leg us. in the rain. It's hit us. And you can see there that the boats are not quite laying the mark. It's going to be a difficult rounding because they're sailing extra low. They don't want to do two jives. They're going to be sailing almost, almost with the wind coming on the wrong side of their sails. On the left-hand side here looking at the screen. Genoa's up on a lingy. They're ready for the rounding, but they still have a ways to go before they drop their kite. We will see the buoys in the foreground. 21 knots of breeze. It's 40 is the wind direction, so very similar to what they sailed the first beat in. There's the rain in the distance. And as they sail through the rain, it will get difficult to hear and see and understand what's happening up the race course. So the that, plan is to the check pushes, them, right? it'll make the wind drop away and it'll shift. So which way is it going to shift? So the plan is to tack with them, says Brad Butterworth. It'll be fascinating to see whether or not Team New Zealand dig in with a real tack. So Team New Zealand putting their heads up in the background. Yeah, I'll get it before we go around, Yoko. Don't worry. Brad Butterworth reassuring Yoko Schumann that he's going to get something. This is the Hitchell on Team New Zealand. You can see it's filled underneath the sheet of the spinnaker because they're sailing so deeply, and it's a little harder than normal to get the sail all the way up. A Lingy smart move just going ahead and getting their sail up well early, so their guys were a little fresher around this part. 
we are. Yes. Like Jared Hughes, and I think maybe Barry Mackay was helping him with the hoist there and the difficulty that he had explained. Now out to 85, 86 metres. I think he's got a wave in the string. It was down to 55. Let's get ready the string. That's Barry Mackay. Got plenty of room to be safe here. Telling Matt Mitchell and Nick Heron and Jeremy Lovis they haven't got time for something. So they're busy on the four deck of Team New Zealand as they are on Alinghi. 22 knots, still from 38 degrees. That's Murray Jones in the foreground. Dean Phipps right on the bow of Alinghi. Getting ready for the drop. There it is. This is the drop on Alinghi. Nice. It's just done. I've got to get this runner up. One minute, second. Take me out, Rico. Take me out, Rico. Come on, come on. Curtis Blue. Take me out. Watch the four. We need a hand. Mark two. Second. Watch the four. settle down here first before they start into any kind of tackle duel. It looks like they had a little better rounding, actually, than Alinghi. It came out slightly higher on the inside. So their air is fairly clear. They want to use that opportunity to get settled down. But you know when Team New Zealand attacks that Alinghi's going to go right with them. So it's 84 meters. Remember that figure? Surely Team New Zealand's got to dig it in. Right now, here goes the Lingi tack. Now, let's see what happened. In the exchanges we've seen before, Team New Zealand has made a game. But remember, it is 21 knots. Remember, there's a, quite a seaway running here. They're happy to go straight here at the moment. Yes, we're happy to go straight here at the moment. So that piece of information is for Russell. Right? That's well, Brad saying he wants to go straight. If, if Team New Zealand were to attack right now, they would hold. And the reason they're doing that is because they're in a left-hand ship. It's 38 degrees on the compass. That's as far left as we've seen it. Uh, it's 37 right there. That's, that's the maximum sort of change to the left. We have seen 48 on the right-hand side. We are in the midst of the rainstorm right now. You see the conditions are just horrible on board. Mike Drummond doing a little work on the, uh, looks like it must be the beach board on the back of the uh, mainsail. Just a little piece of line that keeps the back of the main flogging, flapping, and it is flapping over the air, so. Here's Ward C, Chris Ward, he's got a bit of run. Bring it down for us. Big, strong man. That's better now. But it is blowing in now, 23 plus. Both sails fluttering in the wind Biggest on both left, boats. Yes. This is a powerful blast of wind coming down. You can see the rain through the stream. Uh, it is not nice out there on the water at the moment. All even with him now. 23 and a half stops. We see some water in on board Team New Zealand again. The, the wind screen or the water screen in the back helping out, but there's still a bit of water down in the cockpit. Both boats now just really struggling through the seas here in the big breeze. Sails twisted out 25 knots of wind right now, and it looks like a little more coming. And Adam Beecher uh, is telling Dean Mark a bad way here all the time. Look at the water on Team New Zealand already. There's a lot of water there already. 25 and a half knots. Oh, deja vu here, you can see six knots. See the water just coming in over the rail on the lured side, and there's not much, uh, uh, there's not a lot of width to the rail there to keep it out. They do have bailers to take the water load out of the boat, but they can't keep up with this sort of volume. 
Adam Beachel telling on the mouth bad way. Steve Parker will know that anyway. Both helmsmen will know it. As they're and trying to weave here. their way through the valleys and the troughs. Yeah, the trimmer's having a tough time right now. You know, we're, we're over. We have a new maximum left-hand wind shift, 33 degrees. We have 25 to 27 knots of wind. But I see the sails really twisted out on both boats, especially on a Lingy, where the Genoa is out uh, as far as anything I've ever seen. It's like they're reaching. But they twisted the sails out to get rid of some power and struggle through this big breeze. Now here's a Lingy. They've got water aboard as well. And we shouldn't be surprised at 25, 26 knots. Just gonna try and keep the boat a little more on its feet. Gotta keep it clear, guys. Now the breeze just starting to settle a little bit. There's the, there's the difference between the boats. Still about the same, maybe a slight little gain to Team New Zealand since the rounding of the lured mark. Yeah, it was 83 at the there. bottom mark. So Team New Zealand's made a fraction of a gain. But boy, seamanship is a major factor here, Ian. And they're not fighting in, in the sense we're used to seeing by throwing a bunch of tacks in because when it's blowing 25, 26 knots and you start tacking your boat, you got the waves and the wind conspiring against you. Plus, they're in a maximum left-hand ship, so they don't want to tack off of that. Uh, I'll go it's straight. Just, you're risking a lot to start attacking duel in this sort of situation. I think it's going to come back right after this breeze. <laughs> yeah, exactly, Brad. Let the breeze settle down, and then you start to play the game a bit harder again. Now, as we look out towards Tiri Tiri Martangi and also the end of Front of the Cross, we can see it squaring. Now, the breeze is down to 23 knots. So, this squall that's going through, the breeze will drop maybe closer to 20 knots. It'll be surprising if it holds at 25 plus. But one thing, Peter, we cannot see the windward mark. These guys are going down uh, a lot like uh, airplane pilots that have to use instrumentation to find their way where they're going. They're flying the clouds right now, and they're using the navigational tools to find out where they are on the race course. This is the voice of Adam Beachel talking about bad waves, talking about more pressure on board Team New Zealand. are fighting the weather as much Solid as each other right now. You see a little gain there by Alenghi. There's where they are. You look at the course view. They're getting out near that right-hand side of the race course. So Team New Zealand is going to have to take a risk here before too long to try to make things happen. Or else uh, they relegate the themselves to following in on the right-hand side of the course. Six this way. I see out the suit, Brad, by the way. And that, that's just the distance to each corner of the course. And I'm not sure. I mean, that, that graphic that we had made it look like they were a little closer to the right-hand side than six minutes. Well, the Nisto Bitterelli's coming, Brad, by the with that means if they hold this heading, it's six minutes before they get to the starboard lay line. If they tack now, it would be eight minutes till they get to the port lay line. Now we're starting to see the rain clear a little bit. The wind is down, you know, way down <laughs> to, to 22 knots. More average now. pressure here now. Hold that. Now well into leap number three, the second beat, where we've had pumps at 26 knots as the squall rolled across okay. the race area on the Haraki Gulf. And oh, the lead holding the advantage oh, by three and a half, hard. four boat lengths over Team New Zealand as they hunker down. And now it is starting to clear. It is down to 20 five knots. this way, eight the other. And it's five this way, eight the other. Five if they hold on this heading, or if they tack, eight the other. Now the squall's gone through. Surely Team New Zealand's got to attack to try and climb into the lead of four boat lengths that are leaking half of the moment. Yeah, that's right. And it's very, very. That's good. The marks on the on the uh, eastern end of Turi now, just boat length down from the eastern end of Turi. Can we turn it now? I'll get it. Don't worry. I'll get it. We'd lay it the 41, 45 wind. 45 would lay. Yeah, 45 would be very close. 
going nicely at the moment. A little more breeze, it's windy. Well, the set's a bit of a problem. Yeah. What are the times now? Oh, sorry. Four this way, eight the other. The danger on downwind is to then the roll it. Yeah. Not the other way. No. You can shoot any way you want to. It's three this way, eight the other. abated but only briefly as more tough conditions facing these two yachts in race four of the america's cup still a lingi in the lead they won the start they led at the first mark by eight seconds and the, the second by 17 seconds now on the second upwind leg and they're showing it all john there's a bit of an issue there for team new zealand on the mainsail you can see one of the the draft stripes it's been stuck onto the sail has detached itself from the sail and is flapping round. That will be causing more drag and windage at the rig. So, Team New Zealand's mainsail has a bit of a problem. And we can also see that the sail is not just keeping its aerofoil shape. It's getting blown off the boat by the, the Genoa. It's throwing wind back into the, the, uh, the, 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 the leeward side of the mainsail, but that piece of fabric that's flapping around on the sail. That, yeah. I don't know if they can do a lot about it, but it is detached off the sail. Back again here. That won't be helping the aerofoil shape as the wind goes across the sail to generate the horsepower. Well, we also saw or heard uh, the guys on the water here, I think, talking about the, the difference in the shapes that I think was getting a much better shape. Certainly, we can see there from Team New Zealand, that shot there that they're struggling indeed. And that's a view from my board. Bad that's the main sail trimmer's view. And we can see the front of it bubbling or back winding. And that is quite slow in these conditions. And Ed, you're up close to the action. Is the Linky having the same problems with back winding on their main sail? Well, the short answer is no. The, the, uh, the Linky seems to be a little more twisted on the sail, maybe with the traveler up a bit higher. Uh, but certainly with the Genoa slightly eased compared to what Team New Zealand has. And that is allowing uh, the, the sail shape on Lingy to remain much more constant. And that means that the, the rudder movement and the, the boat movement through the water can be more constant. Uh, on Team New Zealand, they, they seem to have had this problem all through the first beat as well as this one, uh, where the main is going inside and out and inside and out. And it, it does not look as crisp as the, uh, as the trim set up on board a Lingy. Uh, and it's, it's an unusual look. Uh, we haven't seen anybody have this much trouble uh, basically in a straight line at this wind speed before. Let me do a little battery high. It's 
So Lenghi in the foreground here on Starboard Tech as we fly through the Genoa down to Lewis to Team New Zealand. Coming up to see what the advantage line is. 110 meters, so that's a one and a half length gain to a Lenghi up this leg. Maybe that's a function of that mainsail problem that Team New Zealand appears to have with the back winding they've been experiencing. But really, it's been a very simple feat. All we've had was the one tack down at the bottom mark, and then the one here where Team New Zealand tacked first. A lengthy, still in control. It's about four lengths on, just coming down. As we've been watching Virgin Spectator now, it's been a bit of a gain again. Team New Zealand down to 91 metres. So it's pretty much even to what it was at the bottom mark. Swings and roundabouts as boats hit bad waves, as they get a little gust, a bit of a wind shift. But at this stage, that's the view from NZ Our Lady 2 as they power through this big chop out on the Haraki Gold, being kept company by a little petrol, I think, perhaps, a little seabird, escorting them up this beat. They're going to need all the help they can get to climb back into this game and take the fight to a lady as they approach mark number three. Well, Team New Zealand's rig configuration just does not quite look as comfortable as the sail plan and the mass configuration on Alinghi and it's been a, a certainly a, a high point right through the Lloyd Cotton Cup. The rig, the mast and the, the Pretty much sail bearing work. inventory of Alinghi. You can see there that the, we're on board Alinghi and the, the mainsail looks a lot more comfortable. It's not backwinding as much and in fact I think generally the sail's carrying a little bit more twist than the sail on Team New Zealand. That's when we look down the aft edge of the sail, the sail, the sail has more twist in the trailing edge, and it's all about balance. And the helmsman will feel the different twist profiles yeah. by how much weight there is on the steering wheel or how much weather helm the boat has induced. Team New Zealand just does not quite look as comfortable. So we entered our lady two, powering through this chop, and linking up to windward. Very similar, about 82 metres the margin at this stage. Adam Beachel calling a little bit of a lift. Now that should be favouring a lingi, but maybe it's just Team New Zealand that's getting it, because they are in fact closing very slightly. The game here is Team New Zealand, so keep the game close. There it is. Three length, uh, excuse me, three meter gain to Team New Zealand, so very even since the bottom mark. And Team New Zealand's got to keep it close to try and attack on this next downwind leg. Bad wave in three. Change the course to 025. So it's actually big time. Side. 
and the unbelievable disaster. Like a matchstick, it has just snapped. And for Team New Zealand, for the second time in this America's Cup, they sail home. Oh, it's actually safer. Well, again, John, we see Come on, a gear breakage playing a major role in the race. Team New Zealand looked like they were struggling up that windward beat with the mainsail blowing back, the mast under a lot of load, and they thumped through a big wave and... This is it. Moments ago on the Hauraki Golf, there was the warning from Adam Bischel. We've got a big wave coming, and they hit two waves in a row, and the mast has snapped. Catastrophic for Team New Zealand. They're out of race four. This is a sensation again. And they've got bigger problems than that. We can see the wreck here in this big sea wave driving into the side of the boat, go, causing all sorts of carnage yeah, out yeah. there. What they have to do is to try and cut the rig away. They're getting a boy ready to tie to it. And with these waves, with that rig crashing against the side of the boat, it can cause all sorts of trouble. Here's the other view. The boat sailing upwind. Sailing on starboard. And that's the view back to... Team New Zealand, incredible disaster, PJ. Just who would have believed this? Yes, Team New Zealand's America's Cup hopes crashed right around their ears. It looks as though the crew are OK. Well, Peter, just a terrible disaster. I mean, you know, maybe what was the foreshadowing of all this uh, inside-out problem they were having with the sail, but they're just sailing along and something has let go. And uh, and the rig, as you see, it, it gets a little bit of a bow in it as they go down into that wave. Watch this part up here, a lot of pressure on things when that happens. And bang, into this next wave. Maximum pressure right there, and the strain just causes something to let go. One of those many wires that holds the rig up. And TV Zealand's out of the race. And we should say it was 17 to 18 knots when the mast came down. So now it's a question of trying to make sure the boat is not damaged. They have got a line on. Absolute disaster. We did have audio coming off the boats, extremely uncomplimentary uh, uh, from, from the crew about the frustrations of the boat. And I guess that's to be expected. Just but, you know, Pete, a lot of people ask me what it was like when we broke our boat in half in the last cop. You know, what, what did it sound like? What did it feel like? You know, and the only thing I remember very, very strongly was just how angry I was that it happened. It just, well, you know, there's a lot of angry people aboard Team New Zealand, no doubt about it. We heard it, and I don't think our producer will be able to replay it on a family show. They were absolutely furious, and there was more than one voice. Absolute heartache. Three years leads to this. So now, in two races out of four, Team New Zealand are not able to complete the course. Meanwhile, for Alinki, it's all plain sailing. As they march up to mark number three, they still have the rest of the course to go. This is halfway. Oh, even worrying about putting up the uh, spinnaker. Why would they want to put the boat under pressure? Although it is just 19 knots now. We had 26 knots earlier. Right, mark the task right alongside. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
work well. Here we are right out alongside Dean Barker at the helm, trying to cope with all this damage. I mean, it is just horrendous out here. And this is, well, it's just kilometers, isn't it? We've just heard the uh, huge slam as the, uh, as the main swung across. Barry Mackay trying to get some kind of order in here and take charge. I mean, it, when we came out here early on, we were going to say that this was a bit like the, the sea conditions when the racing was abandoned in the Louis Vuitton, when uh, the Swedes cracked their boom. And uh, it's just looked like an ominous kind of day all the time, and those two big waves have clearly done it in. Um, they're, they're obviously trying to not damage the boat too much now. I can see that um, where the top section of the mast is coming down, they've got a boy trying to protect it. But this is a real, well, it's just a complete disaster, isn't it, really? OK, they, um, we can see clearly where it's snapped off. The main absolutely to shreds. And this is going to be an absolute major to try and sort this out, because we can see it down to Lua, the sail is kind of dragging everything, out, everything down as they're trying to sort out the mess. And it's, uh, it's the ugliest thing I've seen out on this water, without a doubt, uh, in, this, in this regatta. It's uh, grim indeed. Well, this is a sight that we didn't want to see out on the Hauraki Gulf, but there always was the feeling that things weren't going very well for Team New Zealand, that it wasn't perfect at all out there. And we'll have another look at it now. And Peter, having seen it for a couple of times, we got the warning, didn't we, from Adam Bishaw, a couple of big waves coming, danger waves. Ooh, big waves, and of course, the, when, they, when the bow punches into a wave, it loads up the rig, and as the boat's going along, we'd already observed the mainsail had not been happy on the boat, there was a lot of back wind, and we can see here now that the, the bow of the boat starting to surge into the waves, and loading up to the maximum, all the rigging and the engineering of the mast, and we can see the wave on the bow now, and the bow comes out of the water. It's lurching back over the next wave, and it was the third wave that broke the mast. The, the, the bow going down, huge loads now transferred up through the spar. It pops out of the top of this one, and I think it's this next wave. Down she goes, and you look at the loads. This 25-ton charges into the wave, and Soon it releases and down it all comes and probably that is the end of New Zealand defending the America's Cup. Well, and let's just say they will uh, be able to get a new rig in and everything, but really you would think that what other damage is there and how has this affected the crew and obviously from the reaction from the crew they weren't at all impressed with what had gone on there. Not at all and who can blame them? When you see so many of these, this crew done a lot of ocean racing and just looking at it as they try and clean this mess up and I'm afraid the America's Cup is heading to Switzerland. Let's have another look at it now in real speed. Here they come, those waves we just talked about a moment ago. Bow goes up. This, hit, this is it here. And what happened was a bit of the wire that connects the rig together. All of those bits of wire failed. The section, the tube, cannot handle it when a wave breaks, when a bit of rod breaks. Well, just imagine how they feel about all this. They've gone through day one where things were almost horrendous. And the language, I'm sure you can excuse the crew for the language that they use there today. Intense frustration for this team. You know, the, the crew obviously have a lot to do with the preparation of the boat, but I'm afraid, John, there's no way to gild the lily. This boat has not been up to the job. We were thankful too that no one was hurt, and that was. Uh, dangerous situation at one stage. And John, we, I think we need to go back and also reflect again what impact did having all that water on board at the bottom end of the swim which we can have on the boat. How much of the water went down below, increasing the overall displacement or the weight of the boat, 
What effect did that have in, in loading the mast up? We can see that the crew now are just trying to get the rig under control, and unfortunately it just comes down to good old brutality, knives, cutting the sail free from the rig. I'm afraid this mainsail will never race again. Quite unbelievable. And one of the real dangerous things with these carbon fibre masts are the splinters. Yeah. The mast is fractured and all the, the, the carbon fibre splinters, and they're like um, when you get splinters in your hand, but they're of the worst sort, and you can end up getting some quite nasty injuries in your hands from um, a, a broken carbon fibre mast. Well, the photographers out there on the Louis Vuitton media boat will be getting the shots that they've been looking for since October the 1st. And these photos will be shot around the world very soon. For those who haven't been able to watch it on television, the distinctly disappointing scene of Team New Zealand under tow again with their mast snapped. They're out of race four. Alinghi, in the meantime, sail away to make it 4-0 and this continues to be a dreadful America's Cup for the holders. As this mask snapped, I'm sure the hearts and hopes of thousands of New Zealanders watching snapped, broken too at the same time. This is a dreadful sight and a sad one too for the defenders of the America's Cup. It really may well go down as a regatta in which the defenders haven't really got into the event at all. But gee. On board, a lot of despair and annoyance as well. We heard when the mast snapped. And there'll be a lot of questions to be asked after this, but in the meantime, we look at what has happened, what the consequences are, and the debris. Mainsail the there, floating in the Hauraki Gulf. That will be picked up by a chase boat. But what a tragic sight for Team New Zealand. So the rig lies over the side of the boat. The crew trying to tidy things up. And that looks like Jared Henderson there. And yes, it is. The pit man. And whilst maybe an aqualung might have been appropriate in the first race, I didn't think we'd be seeing one today as he prepares to 
dive over the side, just try and clear the rigging up from yeah, underneath the boat. We're past it down I'm happy to go whenever you want. But on board at Lingi, there were no smiles or grins when the rig broke. For them it's plain sailing as they sail around the course for their fourth win. As Team New Zealand works to try and tidy the carnage up and get the boat safely back to the dock. They can uh, replace the rig tonight when they get back in and uh, check, have a big thorough, another 24 hour check like they did after race one. They can be back out on the water. Yeah, the key point is as long as the, uh, the, the changing the rigs is not a big problem, they'll, they'll have a square rig at Team New Zealand and the relative uh, and the change over to a new rig will not take very long at all. It's what other damage that's been done to the, the, the hull or the canoe body of the boat. Once you've got rid of the rig and the rigging and the sails, the key ingredient then will be to look at the hull to make sure not too much damage has been done. So overnight we'd expect to see a rig change and the boat to be out on the water again tomorrow. It's anything but plain sailing out there even now for Team New Zealand. Well, the problem they've got is while they're there with the, the, the mast over the side, this is the period of time where the damage will be done with the mast gnawing itself yes. into the deck and the top sides. And I suspect Jared Henderson perhaps is just going underneath the hull to make sure that everything's OK, that the, 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 the integrity of the hull is secure. It must be something that, that you won't be accustomed to. They've got someone controlling it all. What are we doing? Hacksaw's going, trying to free the rig. And, uh, yes. Well, Barry Mackay, we saw with a hacksaw blade in hand. Very experienced offshore yachtsman. Winner of the Whip Red Race on Steinlager 2. Sailed around the world with Peter Blake on Enza. Very, very good seaman. And I suspect we'll see that he's taken charge now to get the boat safely back to dock. Reliability. How many times have we talked about it? And throughout the Louis Vuitton, of course, Alungi had a few problems. They've sailed through this, all sorts of conditions, with no hassles. And reliability, Team New Zealand, who prided themselves on that reliability of previous regattas, have been let down this time. And I can tell you, one thought that goes through my mind, John, is looking back at the leader of Team New Zealand in 95 and 2000, was Peter Blake, who, having experienced bitter disappointments at sea with broken rigs in the past, I know was just so conscious of having boats that would hold together in any condition and that big reliability word that you've just used. Yeah. Yeah. Alinghi, yeah. continuing to sail, as they have done twice so far in this regatta. Okay. Well, yeah. 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 well said, I'd yeah. like to see that. Yes. Peter, when we return to, to talk more about this, while people will say it was only 17 knots uh, when, when the mast snapped, they've been through a period on the previous beat where it had got up to 24 to 26 knots, and maybe we see uh, now Alinghi hanging around the third mark, maybe it's, uh, it was then that the damage was done. Well, maybe that was, and I think when they were going up the second windward beat, Early on, it was up to 25 knots. The rig on board Team New Zealand looked okay, to be jumping around a bit. The mainsail wasn't full. And I think Team New Zealand may be over that first half of the windward beat already were putting the mast under enormous load that it was not perhaps designed for. And in the end, it all just let go. I think it comes down to, Pete, the when we saw that shot of them just before the rig broke, when the bow punched into that big wave, the shock loads that are generated as these big 25-ton boats with enormous loads on the rigs, when they hit a wave and they slow down a good knot or so, and the, the, 
load that just gets transferred up the rig is enormous. And clearly, to me, that was the problem. I wonder if there are other more problems on yeah. board. We can see there a pump being put on board Team New Zealand. I just wonder if the hull has been damaged and yeah. they're taking on water. That there. That does look. And then we can see now the the plumbing being hooked into the, the pump, and that's a pretty decent sized pump. It's going to remove a lot of water. But it would appear, and I uh, earlier on we talked about what impact did the enormous amount of water that was in, co in the cockpit have, did a lot of that get down below, putting up the total displacement of the boat and putting the rig under more loading than what it was designed for. The camera might be out of action from now on. Thank you for that. The camera's swiveling around maybe of their own volition, not by the remote control back at the International Broadcast Centre. There'll be a few of our technicians back in the International Broadcast Centre having heart failure watching this shot of electronics worth probably well in excess of $100,000 looking like it's about to be chucked over the side. I'm sure it's not. I'm hoping that hacksaw doesn't go into the framework holding it up. But now we see the pump almost uh, ready to get into action. Yeah, I wonder, Peter, because we did see several shots of a lot of water going down the forehead hatch as well, down in the cockpit. Uh, the pump is there ready to be started. There we see gentle, gently being transferred a lot of the expensive equipment onto one of the chase boats. And for Team New Zealand, the mop-up continues in race four on the Haraki Gulf. interested spectators out there with uh, heads down and I suppose accepting now what's happened. Uh, Lady Pippa Blake to the right there and uh, that looks like Bob Field from Toyota New Zealand there as well. And uh, they are watching as Team New Zealand endeavours to clean up out there after their dismasting. The mast has snapped on leg three. Team New Zealand out of the race. Let's go out now on board North Star and Peter Montgomery. Right with us here is uh, Scott Vogel, uh, and Scott Vogel is a mask man. He worked originally for the Omahundra, and when they merged with Sutton Spars, uh, the manufacturers of most of the masks in the America's Cup, Scott was actually assigned this time uh, to um, One World's mask uh, manufacturing, but also uh, he is a past winner of the America's Cup with Stars and Stripes out of Fremantle. Scott, just explain the language that you can take with us here and we can understand the loads that these masks are going through when you're designing and manufacturing. Well, I can I can tell you right off the bat, for me as a rig designer for One World, if we came out, of, or when we came out to sail on days like today, my heart would be in my throat all day long. Why? And the reason for that is, uh, because of the class rules, there is a minimum, minimum weight for the mast and you want to be around at the minimum weight. And 
when you're using your weight budget up, you really want to put the weight in the stiffness of the mast in the carbon tube. And so you chisel as much as you dare on the fittings and the safety margins on the fittings. And the day like to put those fittings right up their highest stress levels. Really? So uh, when we keep talking about loads, though, folks out uh, watching this wouldn't quite appreciate uh, how many loads. What are we talking about? 60, 65, 70 medium-sized cars on top of the yeah, mast? we'd say, well, let's see, the compression on the mast at the bottom is about 145,000 pounds, so that's, uh, that'd be a fair few of your average size uh, Chevy Suburbans. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> and then uh, what about the loads coming on, uh, on on the four stay and back stay? Yep, the four stay load would be right up around 30,000 pounds would be, uh, I guess, what's that, in tons? That's, uh, 15 tons or so. All right, Scott, oh, let's have a look are. at the screen here. Yeah, let's come yeah. up and talk us through. Now, you can in the see back. the boat hitting these big waves. The, the deceleration there, that bow hits the waves, is enormous. The, the added mass of the wind on the sails, the, the peak loads just jump up. They probably jump 20%, 25% in, those, in that instance when the boat hits the waves. And is that uh, right? So going up, going up one wave and then coming back down, and the way it got its bow tucked into yeah, all of that wave and that whole force of water, do you reckon what, a load of plus 25%? We would normally put something around 25% on for, for a peak load like that. So really? your standard sailing load, you're sailing along already pressed up pretty good. Hit a wave, you're looking at a spike in the loads and the loads in the sails and the rig of around about 25%. Really? So you're saying it's going that and wham a spike like that and on now the next thing is we see the team New Zealand crew clambering around could it do any damage to the boat I mean the obvious thing of obviously hitting the, the, the side of the boat but could there be anything happening below the boat that we're not aware of other than uh, the kind of shock though that gets into the boat through the chain plates and the mass connections probably not other than uh, the, the rig bashing against the side of the boat which they try to avoid so uh, we had 26 knots well you were just sitting in front of us on North Star Head you could see it for yourself as well, and that yes. squall going through. Plenty well, do you think the water that Team New Zealand had uh, coming around the leeward mark, mm. that extra weight and load of another ton, two or three, could that have added? Uh, or do you just think it's simply just hitting those that wall of water and that big trough that spikes it up, as you put it? Yeah, hard to say how much water's in the boat to begin with and what the effect is. And normally, water inside the boat that can float around actually reduces your stability slightly. So I, I would just say that uh, just this big, big shock that's coming up here was really the major factor in the thing coming down. Yes, because we did hear Adam Beachel say two big waves. So really, that was the trick for the helmsman to try and work their way through it. But if you're going to um, hook the nose of the boat under a big wave, it's, it's very difficult to be able to dodge that yeah. and the obvious power. Sometimes you just can't miss them. Yeah. yeah, that's right. And the wall of water, and of course, after that squall came through, uh, uh, after that wall of water came through, uh, then we could see that the, the seaway had been really pushed up a lot, hadn't yeah. it? Yeah, the seas, you know, out here, especially in this direction, are just short and steep. They're coming up on some shallow, you know, coming up in a shallower part of the, the gulf, and they do stack up and get pretty steep. So, what is your, to summarize, what is your reaction, not only as a specialist mast maker for Southern Spars, but also as a sailor, a past America's Cup winner? I mean, this is gut-wrenching stuff, and we heard some pretty um, uh, basic language from the Team New Zealand crew that sound angry, really. Yeah, I mean, it's a... T it's a it's a tough position because, as you know, the, the America's Cup is a team game, and the team doesn't only include the sailors, it includes the designers and the, the manufacturers and everything that goes into getting this boat out on the water. So um, and you feel bad for the sailors, but, uh, you know, my vantage point, I'd be feeling pretty bad for the guys that, uh, you know, they're going to feel responsible. Someone in the technical team will probably feel responsible and not necessarily their fault. And there you go. All right, thanks, Scott, very much. Uh, very interesting insight. We do appreciate it. Scott Vogel, past winner of the America's Cup on Stars and Stripes off Fremantle and uh, one of the senior managers in the Southern Spars manufacturer that uh, all of the uh, all of the boats, except the Lingi, in fact, uh, ha have had their masts manufactured by Southern Spars. So, meanwhile, uh, right behind us, the Lingi, we can just quickly go through here. We can see just marching on. This is leg number... 
five, pick number three. They look very, very comfortable here. We've got 16 knots now. Uh, they look very, very, very comfortable indeed. Uh, meanwhile, the repairs to Team New Zealand go on as the crews are wrestling with the chaos and carnage out here on the Haraki Gulf. And Alingi, though, looks set to go to match point. Well, this is the scene on the Haraki Gulf now in Auckland. Race four of the America's Cup has turned into a uh, walkover for Alingi. For the second time in the four races sailed, Team New Zealand have withdrawn this time with an impact. The mast has snapped, and it really just has been, again, the culmination of problems that we saw developing throughout this race. Right from the start, when they lost the start of the race, then problems happen. Coming down the first downwind run, tucked into a Lingi's quarter wave, and we see these big waves coming over the bow. And the hatch closed now, but a short while before they had taken a bunch on. And looking there, coming up wind, shipping a bit of water again. Question mark over how much of that went down below. And then up the beak, we saw the mainsail not really looking that comfortable the whole way around the course. Yeah, and then, of course, the, course, the killer blow of the second beach to win with Team New Zealand. Ends at our lady two, pounding through the waves. The bow comes down, shock loads the rig, snaps in half, down it comes. Race over for Team New Zealand. Here we see it again. Look, this will remember this for a long time. A snap two thirds of the way down the mast, huge loads being transferred from the bow, hitting the big waves. And then the cleanup began. The shock will still be with this team. And it really has been a dreadful day. The conditions varied throughout the day. They were keen to race. There's nothing problem, no problem with it when, uh, when the accident occurred. It just has been the mast snapping on Team New Zealand out now. We go to the Haraki Golf alongside Team New Zealand, and here's Martin Tasker. Thanks, John. Tom Schnackenberg with me. 
dreadful sight that we're coming back in on now. Oh, yeah, it's a sight that no sailor uh, likes to experience. Uh, we all do from time to time, but it's dreadful, especially in this situation. Talk us through it. How do you see it happen? Well, we don't know very much because we were watching from um, Sparta, but it's possible that uh, the uh, tip cup failed at the top of the uh, second uh, panel the, uh, where the V2 went in, the second spreader, and uh, that it went from there. We'll have to look at the uh, rig that we get in and uh, make the final you know, determination then. We saw it under huge strain when it hit those two waves. When you look at those pictures now, what were you thinking? Oh, well, looking at them now, you think, oh my golly, something's got to give. And uh, something did. Now, in terms of repairing it, what will happen now? Um, oh, a repair takes a month or so, so that's out of the uh, question for this uh, campaign. But we have swapped the rig out of baby one, and uh, it's a very nice rig. And uh, we're ready to sail again and race again tomorrow. Yeah. Now, what about the, the sort of strain that it would have been under today in these conditions? Well, it's a lot of strain. Uh, a lot depends on how um, you know, the individual waves, the uh, actual wind pressure at the time, how hard the boat's being driven. But both boats are fairly well under load, and we're, we're used to sailing this way. It's just we're not used to dropping rigs. If you were to look at a cause from uh, your perspective now, what do you think it might have been? Well, as I say, it's possible that it's the uh, top of the V2, uh, which is the main uh, load-bearing uh, outside rigging elements. And as you know, we have two of them, and so one of them could have gone before the other, or perhaps the cup itself failed. But I'm, uh, I don't really know because I wasn't on the boat, and, uh, and until we actually look at the damage, uh, we're just guessing. Now we've been hearing about uh, the, the, the sort of loads that these rigs do come under. In sort of layman's terms, what sort of pressures are we talking about when you've got 25 knots of wind in these seas? Well, the jack loads are the order of um, uh, 60 or so tonnes. That's when the uh, boat's sitting in the dock. And then when the boat's leaning over at full uh, power, the leeward rigging is almost slack, which means that the windward rigging is taking all of that load by itself, uh, whereas, of course, in the dock, uh, sharing equally. The total compression on the mast uh, doesn't increase very much, uh, but the, of course the uh, compression on the loads from windward rigging uh, are very much higher. And then when you've got inertial effects, uh, the mast weighs a ton, and uh, as the boat uh, pitches forward, uh, that of course uh, increases the shock loading, and uh, the boat was definitely bouncing uh, over a couple of waves then, and that uh, was obviously the, uh, the thing that pushed it. Now, we notice also that the sail was flogging a bit and that it had, uh, before it happened, and, and, that were, and there was some part of the sail appeared to be coming away. What kind of effect would that have in having an extra strain on the mast? I don't think that would make very much difference. It's nice to have the sail settle down, but having the stripe off the surface of the sail would, uh, uh, would just be an annoying thing, but it wouldn't make any difference at all. Now, in terms of conditions that you've sailed in before, presumably you've been out in stuff like this and coped. Oh yes, in fact before the start we went through a nice squall of uh, similar strength, uh, both boats, and, uh, and coped nicely, so it's just, uh, it's just an unfortunate thing, a very unfortunate thing. Now they're trying to fix the mast now, what are the problems that they're going to have getting it sorted out? Well the trick is to make sure the mast doesn't damage the yacht in any way, and so they've been working very, very hard to keep the mast from the yacht and then of course to pad. Uh, the mast where it uh, rests against the yacht as they bring the boat home. And then it's just a question of lifting it out and putting the mast to one side, putting a, um, uh, a perfectly good mast in its place. Now you can re repair the rig, but what about sort of repairing morale now? What are you going to do? Oh, well, the guys just have to put this behind them, as you can imagine. They're very, very annoyed and uh, disappointed. Uh, you know, they were in the race, uh, they weren't in the front. Uh, but they were in the race and, uh, and the boat was uh, getting along okay. They you know, had raced, uh, I think, pretty well uh, up to that point. And uh, they'll be taking positives out of it and saying, okay, let's just forget this and go out and race tomorrow. So you're saying really that nothing's changed, it's still 5-0. <laughs> that's right, nothing's changed, that's what we're aiming at. It just looks, uh, there are you know, fewer lives, of course. Uh, in fact, there are no lives left. Uh, we just got to win each race. Okay, Tom, thanks very much indeed. John. Well, uh, thank you, Tom, for coming in at what was a very difficult time, no doubt. Um, smiling bravely through that, but a quaver in the voice, I think, as the shock has set in within Team New Zealand. On board, now, Alinghi.
sailing and they don't have to put any pressure on themselves they just have to get around the course and make get four races to go and john let's give the lingi uh, team a wrap because uh one of the features of the lingi right through the louis vuitton and now the cup has been how reliable that boat is. Yeah, no, that's good. It doesn't, I mean, I think I've seen two spinnaker poles break on the boat, and apart from that, in the Louis Vuitton Cup, apart from that, the boat seems to have not missed a beat in terms of reliability as they approach mark number five. Five! So this one would be very conservative. Hey, just the boat. to complete the course, approaching the final mark, having pushed uh, well out of their minds what has happened uh, with their opponents. But it has been another example of the outstanding reliability of this craft and its crew. The final mark of race number four. The Amiga clock ticks on. But it doesn't matter, it's a lingi in front and sailing alone. Just beautiful conditions out on the Haraki Gulf now. Bright sunshine, breeze of around 15, 16 knots. As a lingi, quite rightly, very conservatively, was the spinnaker for the run home. And they will have backed off quite considerably around the course since Team New Zealand no broke the No course change, no nothing, just they will have eased the runner straight off. on down. Sails will have been sheeted a bit softer. Well, it's gone from being a dull grey old day out on the Haraki Gulf to being a relatively clear sunny one. But uh, now the reason they're sailing alone, a lingi that is, is because this team is out. They broke their mast. Let's go back and just listen to what was happening on board Team New Zealand. Yeah, well, they've changed the course to 0 2 So it's easy. see what a shock it was to the team and the warning went out from Adam Bichel, big wave coming up and then you could just see exactly how it, how it happened. But wow, that frightening sound, that terrifying sound of the mast snapping must have sent a chill through the entire crew. Now they're settled down in much more pleasant conditions, probably wishing they might have done what's happened a few times during the regatta, just sort of asked for a bit of a delay. Conditions look lovely out there now, but for New Zealand, it's anything but lovely, glum faces as they are heading back home 4-0 down. Well, the
Well, I've just had the big circular saw out there doing some other release work on board Team New Zealand. It's uh, a day where those who are boat builders and repair men are having to do the most of it. I think, Peter, it's uh, tough work out there, isn't it? What a day. I can't believe this. And, John, it's important to do it right and have someone that's really got a coordinated approach. It looks like Barry Mackay there has got his... He's leading the charge because you want to minimise the damage. Yeah. Remember, they've got to come ashore, regroup, get this broken mast and rigging out of the boat without damaging the boat any further. They don't want to create any more work than what they've already got. So the dismantling of the broken rig is actually pretty important that it's done correctly. Well, of course, we've got... Um... We're looking at the top sides there of NZR Lady 2. The port side just down aft, there we can see it there, just on the left of screen. Quite Damn. badly damaged by the rig where it was crashing into the side of the boat. There'll be a bit of work to do tonight there, we can yeah. see it. The top corner of the boat, all graunched up where the rig was crashing into the side of it. So there'll be a wee bit of extra work to do for the boat builders tonight. Well, of course, uh, out there on the Gulf, this isn't the first boat to, to suffer major structural damage. And, uh, Ed, I know that uh, you've never liked to talk much about it, but I suppose it casts your mind back to last time and young America, and similar thoughts will be going through the minds of these sailors and, and yourself, I suppose, when you see this sort of damage out there. Well, the concept is, for all of us, that you want to have this out of your system before you start racing. Everybody breaks things. Everybody learns that uh, uh, their, their structures are too close to the edge here and there. But you want to do all of that before you get on the race course. And that's the really frustrating thing is when you come out racing and you think you've got it all behind you and you have this sort of a problem. It's, it's a, a tough day. And, you know, these guys, have, every single person on this boat has broken rigs before and, and been in this situation. But you just don't want it to happen on a day like this. You want to be able to come out and have a great race and, Unfortunately, that didn't work out for him, and it's very frustrating for the sailors. Now, uh, how easy is it to get over this sort of thing, Ed, within 24 hours? Because that's what they need to do. Well, it's not just getting over the, the single occurrence. You know, now they're sitting 4-0 down, and it, you know there may be a, a, a feeling amongst some of the guys that, gee, they're just you know anything they do doesn't work. And uh, we've all experienced that in, in various games that we've. Uh, played over the years and you know you just feel like ah oh, you know why am I even doing this because nothing is working for me but then the other side of that is you get to have some positive guys on the team that are there saying come on boys we can still win this mathematically we are not out of it and they've got to psych everybody up and get ready to come out for tomorrow okay. I think it's just on the edge here so it's probably a rep though yeah. As they sail home to the finish line once more the second time in this series without opposition Obviously, get everything checked well. Yeah. We've got nice speed up when we, we go out there tomorrow. That breaking, we've got good speed. Right. Yeah. This was a big sailing of speed. Talking about Team New Zealand, they've got to finish. This is the first mass broken this year. I know that they had mass problems before the racing started here, but. Uh, what it was uh, yeah. Nippon, Prada, and the Swiss last night will be happy in the broken their mask. And of course, Young America that uh, John McBeth won't get up on you on. We didn't break our mask. No, I know. <laughs> but it was a frustrating experience. And, you know, the boats are just on the edge. We talked about that over and over. And you throw See, a bunch of shot boat in there. Uh, As we said before Prada, the race yeah. began, the waves were big today. And, uh, you know, we haven't seen waves like this uh, you know, really at all in the last four or five months since they've gotten, you know, the, the, the Team New Zealand guys have had their boats. And, you know, it throws a new twist to the whole process. But also uh, there will be a major focus on Team New Zealand and how much time they spent on the water and being able to sail in these conditions. Certainly Team New Zealand 2000 would have been uh, ready for conditions like this. Uh, OK, 25, 26 knots is getting up there, but... Uh, the 1718 was to be expected. Well, you just don't know, do you? I mean, the America's Cup in 2000 was sailed in completely different conditions, uh, and, and the vast majority of the Louis Vuitton Cup in 2000 
99 2000 was sailed in smooth water and the one day that it was really nasty was the day that we uh, ended up breaking in it and there was not another day like that for the rest of the series or the cup and if we'd have made it around the weather mark for instance in that race you never would have known that we were about to have these major structural problems so we don't know in 2000 if uh, if Team New Zealand had uh, you know trouble that was just looming on the horizon or not Boy, you hate to see that saw that close to the mass tube, but I guess it's already broken. But, uh, you know, you just don't know. And, and that's the thing that these shock loads are so hard to uh, predict and get right that, uh, you know, it, it's almost impossible uh, to be sure. So, and that's what Scott Vogel was saying earlier that, you know, every day the, the boats go out, the mass guys worry about them because, you know, the shocks are, are the things you can't measure. Well, anything over 16 knots is um, is tough, but uh, when you get the big seaway here, that was a key factor. As Alinghi under Spinnaker comfortably heading down to record their fourth win of this America's Cup 2003. And that picture we can see there is a summary of this 31st match for the America's Cup. Do two jobs, so we're going the right way. Okay. Two. Here it is. Just hook the back stay or something. <laughs> Round we go. You've <laughs> Caused hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of damage. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Somebody's calf, is it? It's a coconut. It's a coconut. Hey? Yeah, that's them. They're still sorting it out. They're over here. Oh, yes. Well, you think we're doing there, guys. Okay. So, Alinghi now continuing to sail this final leg of race four. No opposition there. Uh, if you're one of those who've just joined us, uh, we have to let you know that Team New Zealand withdrew when their mast snapped. Snapped in half, and that was the end of Team New Zealand. They're still struggling, struggling to rectify the situation. They're on tow back to the base at the Viaduct, America's, Har America's Cup Viaduct Harbour. And he won't be able to take the blame for this. <laughs> well, he probably will. Harold yeah. Bennett. Here's now Alinghi heading towards the finish. And to catch up with the finish, let's go back out onto the water. Peter Montgomery and Ed Bed. We've got one uh, point on the sheet. Yeah, yeah exactly. Slide it up. Four seven, one point. 
John Barnett out to the left with the sunglasses. He's been an America's Cup winner before. And That's a fine one there. Race control of the Royal New Zealand Yacht Squadron. but the reality is it's only blowing about 14 and the boats are going along here at, uh, at nine well probably about 10 or 11 knots really uh, pretty comfortably and uh, you know just about straight down wind so there's not much pressure in the sails it's not much likelihood they're going to have any trouble that's the frustrating high. thing for team new zealand because uh, oh, there was 70 to 18 when uh, they broke their mast but well, really wasn't. now it's 14 and the sea state has eased considerably well that's good it's still pretty lumpy, really, but and that's what caused it. It wasn't wind speed. It was it was the waves. And uh, you know we're in as close to the beach as, as uh, you know we've ever been on any of these races at the moment, and it's still kind of lumpy in here where we are. But uh, yeah, you got to be able to handle that. These guys yeah, have done it. Uh, drop? Exciting. Make sure we don't make. To say the least. Okay. Brad Butterworth giving Makes his assessment. Easier, Exciting yeah. to say the least. Yeah. <laughs> Here on February the 28th, the 72nd day. I heard to me while we were in the gear quickly out of the start. Today's the 14th yeah. day in the America's Cup match 31. This is race number four at the finish. And Russell Coots about to go to 13 wins to equal Dennis Connor. Here they come. That's the most successful America's Cup skippers ever. Russell Coots was locked with Mike Vanderbilt on 12 wins. Today it's his 13th. But for others on board, Dean Phipps, Simon Dalton, Murray Jones, Morris Fleury and Brad Butterworth, it's actually their 14th win in succession in the America's Cup. But even more significant than that, at the end of race four, America's Cup 2003, a Lingy go to match point. Just one more win now, and the America's Cup is going to be... 